Okay, let's go back. Welcome back. And uh, now uh, let's continue. It's the last session and it will be for 20 more minutes or, or 20 or 30 more minutes. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so as we mentioned, it is rare in the real world to have purely rotation and purely translational movement. Uh, normally, it is a combination of both translation and rotation. So this turtle boat was done using a robot operating system. But now it's already integrated with the video. And uh, it, use, it is used for robot simulation. So if you do this, purely translation, okay, you move one direction and then you will rotate, you rotate from this point, you can do that. Okay. the combination. One purely translation and another purely rotation. Yeah, it happens independently, but it's like uh, you know now the robot moves in that sense. Yeah, but still separate, but it happens independently. But for this case here, throwing a dice, they, they happen at the same time. The changing of the position as well as orientation happens at the same time. Okay. And here, this is a Miss Universe Catriona Gray from the Philippines. And uh, I uh, make her the, the model because, uh, of course, she's from my country. And uh, she does this, uh, I don't know what they call that, with the tornado walk, or is it tornado walk, where she, they, they say that it's, that's, that's the walk that makes her won the Miss Universe where she turns, she walks and turns at the same time to win her crown in the Miss Universe. So walk straight and then turn like that. And then face the camera like that with a, with a, with a tiger look and then switch like that, flip and then do and then continue walking. Yeah, so it's a combination of translation and rotation. Okay, so now the, we understand motion then. Okay, so how do we control motion? Okay, so one way of controlling motion is this. Yeah, so for example, we have this person that uh, let's just say this is a diving board. Okay, and there's a swimming pool down here. Yeah, just to make sure that the person is alive. Yeah, there's a swimming pool. Don't worry about it. There's a swimming pool there. Okay, so now this person will jump and dive. Okay, to the pool by the uh, by the force of gravity, of course, with the initial force here of jumping and then falling into the pool with uh, with the force of gravity. Yeah, we don't have any control. Yeah, we surrender our, that person surrender himself to the forces of nature. Okay, that is no control. Yeah. So now, how do we control them? Okay, of course. We use whatever tool that we have. Okay, the only tool that we have right now is the robot. So we use the robot to control the movement. In this case, the movement of the person. So how do we do that? What we do is that we attach the person to the end of the robot. Okay, we attach it so that the robot will try to copy. Okay, it will try to copy the movement of the actual forces of gravity, okay? So the person will fall, if the, the robot will can copy that, the robot will fall with the actual force of gravity, okay? Still, there's no control. I mean, there can be a control, but it, it could be minimal control or copying, yeah, somehow there should be a control. But we don't appreciate that because we don't feel that. It feels like there's no control at all. Actually, there is a control. So what, for example, what then, for example, if we say we change the force of gravity, okay? We simulate the, the, the falling of the person when he dives, when he's in the moon and dives into the pool. The pool is in the moon. So what will happen? So we control the robot movement so that the person will feel less gravity and its movement also is feeling like there's less gravity on the earth. And then he falls into the pool like imagines himself that he is in the moon, okay? That is possible with the control 
of of the robot. Right? In fact, it is one of the laboratory equipment on one of the lab uh, laboratory uh, simulation uh, laboratory that I visited in University of Cincinnati. They have uh, uh, they have like this a simulation a robot where they attach the human to a robot to simulate uh, a, a gravity that's different uh, from the Earth in order to train astronauts. Okay, uh, to train them because sometimes, most of the time, they, they train in the pool uh, so that there will be less gravity pulling on the astronauts. But that can be uh, like, like uh, you know, it can be uh, very tedious. Okay, you, you need to wear all these suits and all, provide oxygen like that. But if you just, you know, put the, the astronaut, the trained astronaut at the end of, of the robot and then let him move, you know, the way with the, with the gravity similar to, to whatever environment that he wants to be in, then, you know, it can be done uh, more, uh, it can be also done and maybe less of a hassle. So now they use the robot to, to, uh, to simulate lesser gravity. But also, the other, the other thing that I'm really excited is that, you know, you know, you know line uh, men, they call it line men, yeah? Those guys, the electrical, the, the electrician who go to, to fix the cables on the electrical lines, yeah? They're called line men. Okay? They, uh, they have cranes that will bring them up, yeah? So th there's a bucket, yeah? Where they sit on the bucket and the crane will, will hold them there and the operator down there. Well, it will be nice if that crane can simulate a zero gravity, yeah? So that the electrician will fly, you know, he will fly, just move around like there's zero gravity. Yeah, that will be a nice tool that he can he can easily move around. It will makes him very agile in the air, he can moving easily moving around, and that means that there's there's no need for a person to down there to control the crane, but it is the lineman that will control the movement of the of that crane by his his own command, like his own body movement. I want to go move in this direction and pull in the direction like that, yeah? So it's like swimming in the air and then the, the, the crane will follow his command. Okay, that will be very, very interesting. Okay, so now if that is, if that is then the, the, the way to control uh, the movement uh, for us, the way to control movement and the person in this case, or the move, the, the way to control the hand movement of the robot, then how do we uh, model then the robot motion? Because first we need to model it mathematically. We cannot just, you know, control it. Then everything, I mean, on all these things, in all these uh, computations, in all these uh, experiments, we need to convert the real world into numbers. Yeah, we need to represent the real world into numbers so that we will compute those numbers and you know see what will happen. Okay, and see what will happen uh, if we control it, if we simulate it, you know, uh, if we simulate it in the, in the in, in the computer simulation, and then most likely if they were built based on the actual physical environment in the simulation then most likely that simulation will be very similar to the real world, yeah. okay? So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the basic, uh, it's the essence of what we are doing here, or essence in any physical experiments or any physical representation. We want to convert that physical entity into a mathematical representation, into numbers, okay? So that those numbers, we can manipulate those numbers and do whatever we want with those numbers. And then what, what we see now in those computations, because they are modeled according to the real world, it will also happen in the, in the real world when we try to implement it there in the real world. Okay? So now we need to model, or that means we need to represent the robot motion into numbers. So how do we do that? To represent ro robot movement into numbers, we need to know, there are only two things that we need to know, okay? That is 
the movement of one reference frame with respect to another. That's it. Yeah. This class is all about representing the movement of one reference frame with respect to the other. Okay. We're done. So how do you do that, sir? Yeah, of course we can do that. Yeah, of course, the, the, this is very well established. But I want to say that it is just about the movement of one reference frame with respect to the other. That's how we represent motion. Yeah, that's how we represent motion in many, many things in the physical world. But that's how we represent motion also with respect to robot control or robot planning. So how do we do that? So when we say reference frame, what is a reference frame? A, rep a reference frame, okay, in this case, is represented by three axes, X, Y, and Z, that are orthogonal to each other. Yeah? And so in the case here, we, rep uh, we follow the convention of RGB, red, green, and blue. Okay? Now RGB also, in our case, represents X, Y and Z. In this case, here, X and this is Y and this is Z. So it follows the right hand rule also for the X. Your hand goes to the X and sweep to the Y, and that the thumb points to the Z axis. Okay, that's the right hand rule. Again, right hand rule is that this these fingers point to the X and then sweeps to the Y. And then therefore the Z is in that direction. So that's why that positive X, positive Y, and positive Z axis. By okay. That's why, what, oh, sir, why is it so red? Really? In the left hand rule, you cannot do that? Well, you cannot do that. If this is your X, you see to the Y like this, and your Z will be, it will be in that direction. No, that's left hand rule. So when you go X positive, sweep to the Y positive, your Z should be down here to get a right hand rule. For example, that's X, Y, Z, the Z is the right hand rule. X positive, Y positive sweep, and so your, your Z is in that direction. It's not possible for the left hand, okay? Okay, please uh, try to, to do that with yourself to, to make sure that you understand the so the fingers again points to the positive X. It sweeps to the positive Y and the positive Z is up there. Okay, so now this is also X, Y, and Z of this reference frame. So this reference frame translates. So from here, it moves here and also rotates. Okay, so now our question now is how does this reference frame translates and rotates with respect to this reference frame. So this is frame F prime. How does F prime translates? Uh, how does F prime translate and rotate with respect to frame F? Okay, so that's the basic question. Now, in the robot, you have many, many joints. Okay, the, the pr basic principle now is, is then, we, the basic principle in robot control is that we attach reference frames to each of the joint of the robot. Okay, let me say that one more time. We attach reference frames to each of the joints of the robot. Okay, so how? So for example, here, this is one joint. There's a reference frame, okay? This is this joint moves with respect to the ground. This is a reference frame here, okay, that we call it frame zero, okay, the frame of the ground, okay. Then here, there's another reference frame here attached to link, link zero, okay, okay. And then this joint move, this joint move, and then this frame is attached to, okay. The, depends on depends on I'm very careful here depends on what kind of convention you're following we say that this frame is attached to the link I uh, to the link to the I minus one link okay for example here this frame is attached to the ground okay 
So this is uh, 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 this is a frame zero, and this frame one is attached to link one. So it means joint one moves with respect to link one. So it's like this. Okay, there's one. This is one joint, and there's, for example, this is another. Okay, this one will move. This one, this this thing will move. Okay, see the R move, but this one is stationary. Okay, like that. Okay, so so the frame, the reference frame is attached to this link. Okay, while this this joint moves. So this frame is stationary while this joint moves. Okay, so now this joint. Uh, this frame is, is a stationary, frame one is stationary while joint one moves, okay? Frame two is stationary while joint two moves, frame three is stationary while joint three moves, and so on. And then frame four is, station, is attached to the, to the end effector. So what, what, uh, we will go in, into details uh, in the next uh, few more slides, but what I'm trying to say here is that for each joint, there is a frame that we attach to it. Okay. And that frame will move. Okay. Because the joint moves. Okay. That frame moves. Okay. So now, if for each joint, then there is a frame. So now, we all we need to do is to establish the relationship between this frame and that frame. And this frame and this frame. Do you see my mouse? Do you see my mouse moving or no? Oba King, do you see my mouse moving or no? No? I can see it now. Okay, hold on. I don't hear anything. Oba King, it's visible, sir. It's visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, let me not uh, do the annotation. Okay, so this frame, we need to know the relationship of this frame with respect to that frame, this frame with respect to that frame, this frame with respect to that frame, and this frame with respect to that. That's all we need to know. Because this relationship between frames is represented by a matrix. And all we need to do in order for us to know the relationship of this frame, the end effector or the hand of the robot, with respect to the base frame, all we need to do is multiply the matrices. There's a matrix here that defines this frame against this frame. Then another matrix here, another matrix here, another matrix here. So this matrix multiplied by that matrix, multiplied by this matrix, and multiplied by that matrix. Then we will know already the relationship of the hand frame with respect to the base frame. Okay, so now our major question is how do we express that mathematical representation between frames? Okay, that will help us understand the relationship of no matter how many reference frames there are. Okay, once we know the relationship of the mathematical expression of the two, the relationship of the two reference frames, it doesn't matter how many reference frames, 100 reference frames, it doesn't matter. We will know the relationship of the end of that 100 reference frame to the base frame, because that is what we really want to know in, the, in our case here, that when we control the, the hand of the robot, we want to know how does the hand move with respect to its shoulder. Okay. Or if the hand is attached to the world or to the table, how does the hand move with respect to the table? Okay, Because that is what we need to know because the table, for example, there are things on the table that we want to manipulate. There are things that we want to pick and place, for example. There are things that we want to transfer into certain areas that are reachable to the robot. Okay, So now, our major requirement here then, again, is that we must define the relationship between the two frames. And what is that relationship? The relationship is in terms of translational movement and rotational movement. Okay? Remember, we need to express 
both movement, translational and rotational. And so if you can express those two kinds of movement into a matrix form, then we already have the relationship between the two frames. Okay? So how do we do that? So now I'm just saying that, okay, we'll continue to say that it doesn't matter how many reference frames there are, okay? What matters is that we represent them correctly, okay? So for example, if you have a planar robot, in this case, how many joints are there? One, two, three joints, okay? We attach one, two, three, each joint, there's a reference frame, plus the fourth joint at the end of the hand, okay? And then that's how we attach reference frames, okay? How we define the relationship, we will deal with it later, okay? I'm just, this, uh, this slide is just showing that no matter how complicated the robot is, uh, there is a way to attach the reference frame, okay? We just, there is a convention on how to do that, and we just follow that convention, then we'll be okay. Okay, so now uh, this is the, uh, uh, I forgot the name of this robot. It's, uh, it's a much cheaper, I forgot, it's a dual arm robot, it is a cheaper robot. I forgot the name, but anyway, it is similar, the, it's built is similar to the uh, most earliest, one of the earlier and the most popular early robots before is called Unimate, Puma Unimate, which is a six degrees of freedom robot. It's a, the, the structure is similar. And uh, now, uh, no matter how, how is uh, the motors, you know, are connected okay, with the structure, with the robot structure, there's a way to attach reference frames. So uh, this base frame is here, there's one joint here. Another, another joint here, another joint there, one more joint, one more joint, and so on. So if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are seven joints plus the ineffective joint. Okay, so these are seven joints. Well, it's not exactly the same as the Puma. The Puma has six joints only. So normally when a robotic arm like this has seven joints, they're called anthropomorphic uh, robotic arm. Anthropomorphic because they're similar to the human arm, okay? So this one is the Kuka robot that has seven degrees of freedom also. And then the nice thing about this that is that the, the reference frame are properly aligned. So we can put a reference frame here. This is one joint going positive and negative, rotation positive, rotation negative, one joint positive and negative rotation. Again, another joint, another joint, another joint, and the last joint. So if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven joints, yeah? So there are seven joints, you can attach seven frames here. So the same thing, this is also the Kuka robot. It's just showing that this Coco robot is actually really anthropomorphic. As you can see, the, the structure is built exactly the same as the human arm, okay? It has also the same number of frames, okay? This has seven joints. The human arms also has seven joints, okay? And this one is the very simple uh, dual arm. Okay. This is one arm here, another arm here, and both arms are holding this, uh, this object. Okay. This is the basic uh, robot, a dual arm is the basic uh, configuration of the robot of two cooperating robotic arms. Okay. So two arms cooperating to control this or to manipulate this object, okay? How do we control that? This is uh, uh, another level of control, okay? So we will not be uh, uh, considering that kind of control here, but the only thing that I want to emphasize is that in the, in the same case, there are also reference frames that you need to attach to the joint. So each joint have reference frames, each joint here have reference frames, and there are also uh, the reference frames attached to the object as well as to the world. Okay, one, one reference frame to the world where all of these reference frames will be expressed. Okay, so now we continue. Okay, maybe I, I, I leave here so that uh, later we'll continue on the next meeting on the basic information of position and translation. Do you have any questions?
we're going to the end of the any questions or any reaction from what I showed you. Just ask any question. Are you inspired? Or are you not interested? But it's a boring study and you wonder why I survive in that kind of boring topic. What makes me so energized in something that is so boring? <laughs> you have a question, Mr. Tomisa? Or maybe Mr. Coke, yeah? Mr. Coke, can you answer? Do you have a question? In, in, a proxy of Mr. in Labano is the Coke. So we'll ask the Coke. Any question, Mr. Wall? Okay, let me ask you a question then. Okay, Mr. Timana. Do you think in the future you can live with a robot? For example, maybe uh, your wife will be a robot? <laughs> no, sir. No, not my wife. Not your but, wife? Yes, sir. Not my wife. Okay, you cannot but... interact with a robot. <laughs> I mean, like a partner, no? No, sir. Why? Maybe. Why? Yes. Um, I feel like they're not, they're not yet. We are not yet at, at a stage where it can. Uh, <laughs> it's it can compare to a human like all around. Okay. There are those features that humans have, which where robots are not, do not yet have, and will never. I doubt they'll ever have them. What but, if they will have? Okay, what are those features in the humans that you demand? <laughs> from a robot. Ah, sorry. Yes. I mean, just so, I mean, what will make you change your mind? That is the question. Because you, you think that the robot is not still capable of doing certain things. But what if the robot somehow 100 years from now or 20 years from now, the robot will be capable of doing those. So you will be okay with the robot <laughs> to be your wife. Well, not I mean, really. it's just a, a hypothetical question. You don't really have to marry the robot tomorrow. It's just a hypothetical no. question. What are those requirements that you have? <laughs> well, I, I'd say it's just... Uh, <laughs> it's based on what, what, what we believe. Uh, it's more of a cultural thing than really... Because I believe in the future, yeah, we'll, robots will get there and most people, some people might prefer them over actual humans, but for me, it's just a cultural thing. Like, I, Could how, you, how can you define it? I mean, it's yeah. general. Because I want to give you a robot. I want to satisfy you want to give me what you want. So you have to tell me exactly what is it, what's the limitation of my robot so that I can change it the way you want it. I'm, I'm not saying though, I'm not saying limitations to have limitations, even if it's perfect, perfect, but cul cultural wise, how I was raised to worry like a man gets married to a woman, that's, that's full stop. One man, one wife, full stop. No well, one man, one woman, robot. It's a woman robot. It's not a man robot, it's a woman robot. But it, it, it wasn't there <laughs> back, it wasn't there when back then so it's something we have to like get used to but for us maybe the next generation or in the future they would but not not our generation yeah i mean i'm not asking about our generation i'm asking that you place yourself 200 years from now that you live 200 years from now uh, oh okay if it's 200 years from now and yes and then the most robots probably, are capable yeah. of doing everything that human can do you think you can marry a robot most probably. You think? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What could be the limitation? What could be something that it cannot? What do you think? Even how advanced the robot is, what do you think the robot cannot give you? 
different from that the human can give. I mean, it's just um, uh, uh, right or wrong answer. Uh, I'd say the question should be, um, what what can the robot the robot give more than oh, the more. human care? <laughs> I thought you just want a human. <laughs> you want more. What more? What, more, what than more the can human. you do? Huh? What more can you do? Yes, <laughs> it's more of what more can you do? I mean, if you can like, I mean, if it's a robot, you you have like, I don't know, you can like switch it off or whatever. So it's compared to a human where you don't have much control. I don't know. <laughs> so you want more, Mr. Temana? Yeah? <laughs> I thought you just want human capabilities, but you want more. Yeah, But it's nice, you know. Well, maybe if you, you don't really need to argue with, with that, you know, of course, husband and wife have argument. So if you don't <laughs> want it to argue, then you just switch it off. <laughs> no, you just switch no it off. <laughs> 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 well, uh, if that could happen, then yes, but maybe you cannot beat it with an argument. It's too smart for you. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets too smart, you just switch it off. Yeah, and that's it's the off. end of the yeah. argument. <laughs> okay, what else? What about you, Miss Rata? Do you think you can marry a male robot? No, sir. Why? Because I want like physical touch of a human skin. Okay, physical touch. Yeah, that's that's one. But maybe robots can be capable of physical touch as well. Like they feel like they will feel like human touch. Mm, still too much for me. To have yeah. something that knows everything. Yeah. Because somehow yeah. internally. Someone telling me what to do. Tell you what to do. Yeah, the robot. You don't want to be told what to do. No, sir. I should be able to tell the robot what to do, not the other way around. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, it's a very advanced robot. You can tell it what to do. There's no question. Yeah, that one is, uh, I can give you a robot like that, but the human touch, I mean, that human touch, I can give you a robot that does human touch as well. I mean, if you just feel the touch, it will feel like a human. But what I, I think what I understand what you're saying, that internally there is some communication between humans that you don't, that the robot doesn't know. Like, for example, I can read your mind or I can even know how you feel by by feeling not even i i know from your face even if you smile that you're still lonely like mr tom yeah you just smile you try to smile mr tom but i know that you're lonely you know i can feel it like that and for that we cannot feel that with a robot because there's no it's like probably there's really something like a conscience for example that tells you that the, there is an uh, an unconscious communication or an intangible communication or something that not, I don't know if you can really understand 200 years from now, or maybe we will be capable of understanding that. There's a communication between humans that somehow we don't understand fully, but we still, we, but we know it's there. Yeah, and probably that one is a very difficult area for the robot to be able to replace. If the robot can replace that, then maybe you know, the whole world will be just robots, no need humans. And because for them, they don't die. We will, we grow old, we will die. But for them, they don't, they will continue and they will populate more. Yeah, and then they will just switch partners here and there because you know, you will die eventually, you will know that. Yeah. So who's gonna service the robots? I don't know. It's for us to design it. You know, well, the major objective of robotics is to have a robotic maid or to have a robotic helper in the house. But that is very far from, from now. 
but slowly, you know, you have a robotic Roomba like that, uh, like this, for instance, right? a robotic nurse like that that will help you. But it's not like a human humanoid that really helps you with many things in the house like a human uh, person. Okay. But anyway, it's something to think about, and uh, it's too advanced for our class. But I would just want you to to stretch your imagination, because somehow probably we can help uh, fully understand what's what we, how we are how our our discussion today will be related in the future of of uh, robotic technology. Okay, okay. In case uh, there, there are more other questions that you want to ask me. If not, then I will see you next meeting. I will continue with the discussion. I just, uh, uh, I will ask uh, Ms. Camilla the next meeting uh, whether she is willing to, to marry a human robot or not uh, next time. Okay? Okay. Bye. Thanks for today.